Hey everybody. Today we're doing some more multiple linear regression in R. I'm going to be working with the Parenthood dataset. This is included in the Learning with Learning Statistics with R textbook by Danielle Navarro. As with all things Danielle Navarro, I highly recommend that book. I've loaded up Tidyverse, of course, as well as Broom and GGalley, and I'll comment on those packages as I get to the functions in them that I'm going to actually use. Um, here on line four, I've selected out the fourth column of that parenthood set. It's basically just row numbers. I don't really need that. As I glimpse the data set, I see that I have three variables. In particular, notice that there's danielle.grump. That, that is her grumpiness level um, the next day after getting a certain amount of sleep and after baby got a certain amount of sleep. Intuitively, we would expect Danielle's grumpiness level to be related to the amount of sleep that both she and her baby got previously. If we're going to make a linear model, we should make some attempt to verify that there's actually a linear relationship between our response variable and the explainers. So we would want a scatter plot between baby.sleep and dan.grump and between dan.sleep and dan.grump. And I could do this with ggplot. I'm going to use the ggpairs function in the ggalley package as a shortcut for that. And that just needs one argument. It needs the name of the data frame, so parenthood in this case. And that's going to give us a three by three array. It's going to give us a different plot for each combination of the variables in this data set. Here I'm interested in the two plots on the bottom row, that the two scatter plots in the bottom row, that compare Danielle's sleep level to her grumpiness level and baby's sleep level with Danielle's grumpiness level. And in each of those two plots, you can see a generally linear relationship. So a linear model is definitely going to be justified in this case. Let's call it model. The command we're going to be looking for is lm. We put the response variable first, dan.grump. And then we can list the explanatory variables separated by a plus sign. So dan.sleep plus baby.sleep. In this case, the um, all the other columns in the data set other than Dan Grump are explanatory variables. So I don't actually need to list them all um, explicitly. I can just put Dan Grump tilde dot to indicate that we should be using all the other variables as explanatory. We do still have to specify the data set here. And of course, that's parenthood. Let's uh, see this. Let's get the summary of this model. OK. So in the estimate column, we get our coefficients. So according to this model, we can take Danielle's grumpiness levels to be approximated by 125.97 minus 8.95 times the amount of sleep that she got plus 0.01 times the amount of sleep that baby got. Now glance at these p-values over here on the right. In particular, I'm noticing that baby.sleep is not statistically significant. In other words, if we take a null hypothesis that the coefficient here is actually zero with all the other variables still in the model, the alternative hypothesis that it's not equal to zero, there's really no evidence at all in favor of that alternative hypothesis. In other words, the data is very consistent with the hypothesis that the coefficient baby dot of baby.sleep is equal to zero. Now that might seem surprising, of course, because as any parent knows, the, your grumpiness level the next day is very closely tied to the amount of sleep that your baby got. Our main goal from here on out is going to be trying to try and get some insight into that. And um, the first thing that I want to do as a step towards that is actually to make a simpler model. So let's do a model just using the baby's sleep. So I'm going to redo my previous steps, dan.grump being explained by, but in this case, I just want it to be explained by baby sleep. And the data is still parenthood. Okay, so with this simpler model, we have the equation for the approximation for Dan's grumpiness levels to be 85.78 minus 2.74 times the amount of sleep that the baby got. And in this case, we see a p-value that is extremely small, 8.45 times 10 to the negative 10th. That's saying that the null hypothesis that the coefficient of baby sleep in this model is zero um, is just not tenable. So the difference here is that that null hypothesis is um, against a model that is just including um, an intercept term. In other words, the sample mean for the response variable. 
Whereas this previous model, the null hypothesis was referring to a zero coefficient for baby sleep versus the model that did include the intercept and dance sleep. So it's substantially different. And we can get further insight into this by looking at the relationship between um, the amount of sleep that Danielle got and the amount of sleep that baby got. Let's just go back to the plot that we already have. So I'm looking at the scatter plot in the middle of the first column. Danielle's sleep versus baby sleep. And you can see that there's a strong correlation between those two variables. As Danielle's sleep level goes up, so does baby's sleep level. And I'm sure that uh, in reality, the relationship is exactly the opposite in the causal sense that as baby's sleep levels go up, Danielle's sleep levels are tending to go up just as a result of that. We can also get a correlation here. Let's go ahead and do that in parenthood dollar Dan sleep and parenthood dollar baby sleep. We can see that we have a correlation of 0.63. Okay, so um, let's do one more model here. I'm going to copy and paste. I want to do model just for Danielle. So Danielle, model Dan. And I want to model Danielle's grumpiness levels just with Danielle's sleep levels. And let's get a summary of model Dan. Okay, so obviously that is a statistically significant thing here. I think what's really going on underneath the hood here is that the amount of sleep that baby is getting is affecting how much sleep Danielle is getting, which is in turn affecting Danielle's grumpiness levels. And so if we know how much sleep that Danielle got, we really have all the information that we need to say or to guess how grumpy that, they will, that she will be the next day. We don't actually need to know how much sleep baby got because that's kind of already taken into account when we know how much sleep that she got. Um, I would like to compare these three models a bit more directly. It, it's a bit unwieldy to scroll up and down. For instance, if I want to compare the adjusted R-square values, I can do it, but these outputs aren't tidy. So this is where I'm going to use that broom package. I'm going to use the glance function in this case, which lets us glance at the overall um, fit of the model. So I have three of them. I have just the basic model. I have model baby, model baby. And I have model Dan. OK, so now we can see an overall summary of the fit of these three models. There are a number of statistics here that we could use to judge between the models. Um, for instance, the Akake information criteria is underneath the hood here. It's not being visual. It's not being shown right now. Here, I'm going to focus on the simplest one that's particularly helpful, namely the adjusted R squared value. An adjusted R squared gets bigger for a model with bigger fit. So this is very similar to your R squared value, which is going to give you, roughly speaking, the percentage of the variability in the Y value that's explained by uh, explanatory variables, except that the R squared value always gets bigger when you add more variables into your model. So there's no penalty for additional complexity. Whereas the adjusted R squared value does impose such a penalty. So if you put in noise variables, it potentially drives R squared up, but should always, but should not um, necessarily bring up the adjusted R squared. So for our larger model, we had an adjusted R squared of 0.812. For the model just taking into account the amount of sleep that the baby got, 0.313. And for the model that just takes into account the amount that Dan of sleep that Danielle got, we get an adjusted R squared of 0.814. So if the overall model and the model that just uses Danielle's sleep are fairly similar in terms of their adjusted R squared, but the adjusted R squared for the amount for the model that just has the amount of sleep that Danielle got is just a little bit higher. So we might want to just prefer that model.